let's just start with a few things that we're going to be we're kind of working on right now that I would recommend when you're with kids. Uh, um, number one is uh, focus attention on what it is you want them to focus without delay. You want to go go right that. You see something like the, that, like those antlers right there, right? You want to kind of rush to it and get down to it and focus their attention just as quick as you can. And then you know, ask yourself rather than rather than saying this is this and it does this and this does this and let's move on to the next thing. Ask yourself inside, why is it I really like this? What is it about this that that, that, that turns my passion on? And then it even is a nice thing to share rather than say, this are antlers of a Colombian uh, 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 black-tailed deer and they live here and da-da-da-da, to say, you know what I think is really cool about that? You wanna know what my favorite thing is about that? That's a good way to start. What is it that you like about it that you can share? You're sharing your passion rather than just being a library kind of a thing, right? Because don't they're on that all day. They're on Google all day, right? They're spending eight to 12 <laughs> hours a day on a screen. How can you make that different? They'll, they'll never be able to have a machine replace that, right? And so I think, I think it's really important today for us to distinguish nature by, by sharing our passion with them. So the way I would look at this, is I would say, I would look at this and say, whoa, whoa, look what we got here. You know what I think is really cool about this? That when that was living, it had blood moving through it and it was really full of velvet and that that is only on the males and the males use it to show how strong they are. And then when the strongest ones have the biggest, they have biggest antlers, they're the ones that get to get married. All right, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Do you see what I mean? You see how that is so different than antlers kind of a thing, right? <laughs> kind, of the, the, kind of the way we're kind of trained. That's what Google is, isn't it? Antlers, all right? Um, in fact, now what they do, they have a thing where you just take a picture of it, will tell you, okay, move on, what's the next thing I can take a picture of, right? We really need to distinguish yeah. ourselves these days. That's the whole point of this, all this, this, this thing here, in, in, in my opinion, so that they can see that there's a human and that there's life <laughs> uh, that they can't see and spend so much time. On, on, on a screen. Does that, so that's kind of just sharing with you my philosophy and that's what we'll be doing today. I'll be practicing that with you. Okay, so when I see something that I think is really cool, I'll share with you why I think it's really cool. And these are shed. These were usually shed. They have a little area right here where they break off here. And, uh, but these weren't. This particular deer died with them on. And so we can see part of the cranium there. And we could take a look at the fissures and all these different parts. And another cool thing about this, one of my favorite things is that you don't often find antlers that have, uh, that, 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 that aren't eaten by rodent, rodents, because this is how the rodents get their calcium. Mm -hmm. And how does that relate then to, are they getting any advantage from the rodents? Right? Is there any mutualism going on here? So, you know, how are they partitioning resources? This is, this is the way that biologists think when they're out in the field, is how is all this stuff interrelating? And the way in which things interrelate is predator-prey, competition, symbiosis, living together, mutualism kinds of things, and, uh, and of course, within the species, the whole uh, reproductive cycles and all that, the seasonal cycles that are based by that, okay? So today, I'll be sharing with you not only uh, what I can share with you about birds, but the naturalist perspective. How is it that we look things? How is it that we share those? What are the things that, uh, that I've seen that have worked over the three or so decades that I've been doing this, okay? That sounds good? Survived by knowing scat and tracks and that whole tracking things. There's something deep within us that's trackers in all of us. These are very popular amongst uh, people and kids and naturalists these days. And so it turns out there's a whole crystal ball here. We see some seeds here that we see from some fruit that's uh, part of this whole thing. Do you see this right here, right here? See this little, mm -hmm. this little area? Do you see it's woven cords? When those cords are all woven and braided like that, you know it came from a mustelid or a skunk, all right? So some sort of a weasel, member of a weasel family here. And we can see that that's uh, very likely. Now, um, because it's on a promontory like this, and because it's twisted like that, and because it has a lot of different things in it, it probably is skunk. Skunk love promontory, promontory. And if you see skunk scat on the trail, you can literally, I've been doing this for years, you can measure across the trail, and it's like they have a little ruler or something when they get out and poop. <laughs> it's right exactly in the middle. I'm not kidding. It's, it's actually uncanny. And so do you see that I'd like to show this. And then the, this, of course, then 
uh, the anal glands have a particular scent which then allows this to spread out more because it's a promontory and the skunk says hey this is my place like our little business card and there's all kinds of information for that <laughs> all right and so the next skunk comes around they smell that they get all this information from each other so scat is like little address numbers and white picket fences and things big fences small fences all mm -hmm. kinds of information that's in that mm -hmm. and so sharing that with children is hey this is a really cool thing did you know poop is like really cool and that naturalists spent a lot of time studying that i have a i have a scat collection that i think might be one of the biggest in california i've got <laughs> things like beaver which is really difficult to get because yeah. it breaks down in water and you could trade three of those for one mountain lion <laughs> <laughs> I go to the scat convention. Uh, I got my mountain lion and a blue velvet gold case. I'm all like, well, what do you think? You know? So all kinds of cool stuff. Canopy, in the middle of the canopy, make a clock. Go down to four o'clock and then come up and you'll see them kind of moving in there. You can bring your binoculars in. Is it in the tree or beyond the tree? It's in this tree. In this tree. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. And it just flew up there right in front of us. It had two outer white tail feathers and it had a black head. The amazing thing about this bird to me is that it has so many babies throughout the year. They'll nest like two or three times and they nest at like five or six babies. And they're probably one of the more common birds. There it is. And it's flying over across there. You can see it as it flies, it's flashing its two white outer tail feathers. Did anybody recognize that bird? Yeah. Did you see how I waited to talk its name? Rather that we usually just want to go to its name, right? So what is it that was cool about that bird? How do we find it? Look what it's doing. Then, okay, maybe we can talk about it. Tonight. So remember, they're, remember they're, they're trained to just get into names and that's it. So we don't want to leave names out. But if we downplay them, we'll bring nature in with them more. It's a hard thing to do because we're trained to just look at names. Yeah. So, uh, so that bird stays low, right? That bird uh, you won't see very high, except for the males when they're singing. They have a wonderful melodious sound. That's one of my favorite things about juncos. And another cool thing about juncos to me is their name. It's what they call the person that would uh, decapitate people that had the white, the black uh, 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 hood over its head, and they have a black hood. Well, the males do. And another thing that's really cool about them, we won't go too much because I know we're standing in the sun, but a really cool thing about them is that they have more subspecies than just about any other passerine. Oh, so really? if you look across the, a map of North America, you'll see all these little subspecies here. Mm -hmm. And if you look in the book, uh, 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 you'll see actually quite a few species that are the yellow-eyed, and then there's this, you know. And so biologists saying whether they're a subspecies or, or, or um, agreeing whether they're a subspecies or a species, species has always been kind of contentious. So they go back and forth from species to subspecies. Because remember, that stuff's just made up in our head. <laughs> right? I mean, we just, we just, those lines are artificial. They're for us to figure out. And so, juncos really mess with them. <laughs> yeah. uh, are, are sparrow-like, yeah? And, uh, and so, he stopped his flapping when he went down a little bit, but then he went like that. So, he was fluttering pretty fast. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't call him a glider. Feathers. Why do you suppose? Because birds that lie low, that are in open areas, need to let each other know where they are. And so, it turns out that many gregarious birds that live out in open lands have white tail, tail feathers mm -hmm. and that's how they keep together. They just are able to watch each other because that oh. flashes so it's easy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, he was just doing push-ups. David told you all about why they do the push-ups I'm yes. sure and uh, why they're so prolific and uh, ubiquitous and uh, another uh, uh, they're, they're quite diverse. Really cool. Yeah, uh, what the kids call blue bellies. Oh, it has a V and it teeter-totter. Yeah, yeah, teeter yeah. Well it can't do that very well Oh, or, or to be able to do that, the trade-off is that it's difficult for it to take off. And so if it's just eaten, it has to really fill itself, all right? And to take off, it would need wind or to run really fast or to run off a cliff because it wouldn't be able to get that lift that it's needed. And so if it's eating something and a predator comes up and wants to eat the vulture, the vulture will accurately puke a, a, a spray of rotting flesh into the face. It's actually quite accurate. It gets, uh, it's up to uh, nine feet. Oh, They're wow. accurate right into the yeah. face, wow. which of course will detour what's ever after them. <laughs> and it's light enough it can take off. Uh -huh. <laughs> I volunteered at the bird rescue um, a few years back and whenever you would catch them, you always kept them away from you. Yeah. Yeah. I had one. Yeah. Hit me oh, once. Yeah. I used to work for wild care. And considering what they eat. Yeah. And it's a stream and it's fast and it's like you just don't yeah. even know it. And what does it smell? 
You think vomit smells? How about rotting flesh vomit? <laughs> uh, but anyway, you know, not many birds are able to experience, uh, uh, you know, chemicals, uh, olfaction we call it, but they have an area of the brain that's larger for smell. And so they're able to find things that are uh, putrefying uh, 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 by, by the smell. And they're not that good at eating things that are freshly dead. They have to wait a while. That's why they hang out those roadkills for a while. They have to wait for them to break down so they can get through it. In Africa, the vultures have special individual vultures that can open them up. And everybody's like, oh, the king is here. <laughs> Thermals are not very wide. And so they need to be able to teeter within them to stay within them. So here's the, here's the thing. Up, 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 up. Up, 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 up. And they can do that all day without flapping because they're a feast or famine bird. They don't get to eat very often. So they really have to save energy. Another thing they do to save energy is they torp at night. And so that's why they're out there spread wing posture in the morning. They have special arteries at their rump that brings blood there, picks up the heat from the sun, runs to the rest of the body, and then they can warm up because they have to cool down. Most birds don't have to do that. So that's why they're all out there. Anybody ever seen them doing that? Yeah. 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 There's tracks besides that it's the that uh, Colombian black-tailed deer that we saw the antlers from there before. Is notice that this track is right on top of this track? Yeah. Because when deer walk, they have to be quiet. And so they watch where they're walking oh. for their front feet and their hind feet automatically go where their front Whoa. feet just went in. That's called a registration. So this way they can be anatomically quiet. They don't have to go, but like us, we would have to go, okay, am I, is that gonna hit right into where I just hit? You know, like that. They just walk that way. And predators too. So when you see registrations, you can tell a lot about what's going on. Whether they're trying to be quiet, or whether they're trying to get away from something, or whether they already noticed something. It's all kinds of information. So look at this. You see this here, and yep. then you see here right, right under it. We call that a registration. So my point is, is that there's all this incredible information when you look at tracks. And so at the very least, we want to point out tracks, and that there's all that information, and maybe some examples if we have some. At yeah. direction of where the animal is going. You know? This one, this one points. So yes. it makes a little heart and the yes. point of the heart is the way it's going here yes. and so There's you can see right so There's this is the hind foot and this is the forefoot okay. and uh all kinds of stuff's going on. How it has the little Velcro things that are in there that okay. keep it, and maybe you can get it just right. And probably this was on a breast or something like that. You can pass it around and maybe look at it with your scope, you know, and, and take a close look and, and just awe at an incredible feather. Yeah. Is that the sound? Good question. Yeah. What's that? That's the sound? Mm hmm. Really piercing. We've got one in our yard. Yeah. yeah it hangs around. And so. I had the same exact question. So, what are they doing? Why are they oh, doing that? For fun? Just as my spot, that's, my spot my that's my territory. territory. This is my place. This is my place. This is my place. This is my place. And they'll do that a lot more as we move into the winter because they're going to start setting up all their territories now and they're just getting done with nesting and it's time to, time to, uh, there we go. There we go. We've got a raptor way up there. And we can see it doesn't have a dihedral like the turkey vulture. And it also um, is very possibly where that sound was coming from. Just saw me jumping around. Yeah, close by over here. Yeah. 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 Well, no, we got that one here, but uh, oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, we can see the guy making the sound right there. Look at that beautiful tail, yep. that black and white tail. Yep. Look at him back and forth. So these guys look like they're working out their territory right now, huh? Mm -hmm. Flying around, screaming. Both of them, both red shouldered hawks. He doesn't show any red right now. Yeah, well, the the red shoulder is not easy to tell in this because kind of a situation. The, is, the red part of it is higher on the shoulder, isn't it? Yeah. You, yeah. You don't see it as easy if you're looking. It's very it. difficult to see yeah. when it's flying, yeah. uh, but very easy to see yeah. when it's perched. Yeah. Huh. But the best way to tell that, I would never uh, use red shoulder. I would use that it's circling around and screaming, because uh, none of the other birds do that. And also, do you see that black and white tail? Mm -hmm. No, none of the other birds have that are wide like that. Now the accipiters, the Cooper's hawk, uh, they have tails that look kind of like that, but they're more brown and white, and they're but they're long and narrow. So this belongs to a group of birds of prey we call buteos, and buteos have relatively short, stubby wings, and they have uh, uh, wide tails, and that's used for soaring. And uh, these guys are the most unsoaring buteos we have. 
<laughs> yeah. Because yeah, he keeps uh, uh, Occipiters, like the Cooper's mm -hmm. hawk and the and the and the yeah. sharp trend hawk that we find in the forest, they have long tails and short stubby wings for maneuverability. Mm -hmm. So there's basically four different kinds of raptors, and if you have those four different types, you can place each one into that, and then it's easy to remember them. So you've got the buteos that are soars, you've got the occipiters that are maneuver. You've got the long, sharp wings with a medium long tail built for speed, like the falcons, all right? And the kestrels, you see that. And then you have the harriers, which are low patrol, yes. and they have a facial disc to listen, and they teeter totter really low, like our northern harrier used to be called a marsh hawk. Okay. Yeah, and so uh, uh, you can see most of these on your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's a, uh, a buteo, all right? Here's a falcon. See the sharp? Mm -hmm. See the wide? See the slotting? No slotting? See the no slotting? See the sharp? And right on the breast here is... No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I meant of the bird. Uh, you can see, <laughs> you can see that little, uh, that, uh, that short stubby wings and long, and long, uh, uh, long, long tail for maneuverability. So let's review real quick. So you've got the so buteos for soaring. Mm -hmm. You've got the occipiters for maneuverability. You've got the falcons for speed and you've got the harriers for low patrol. What do we call all of that that we talked about back there? What are they doing? They are doing that. They are partitioning resources by their different shapes and their different ability to do what they need to do. So that they can have weaker wood, not have to spend so much time and energy, uh, uh, you know, making the little pits that they put those in. So they make those first and then they have the, you know, they, they wedge them in there. Very difficult for anything to get them out except for them. Yes. And of course they protect them as well. Has anybody ever tried to get one out? Yes, I have. <laughs> they're, they're in there good. Yeah, they're in there. So they, and they're maneuvering them all the time because they shrink. Yes. So they eat insects during the summer and then they eat the acorns in the winter? That's right. They're, well, they're eating insects uh, yeah, from mid-spring into about the end of fall. And then in the winter they have a fight because those once it starts getting cold, those insects, you know, it's hard hard for them to find them. Yeah. And also there are regional behavioral differences in acorn woodpeckers. The acorn woodpeckers that live down in Arizona don't tend to make granaries, for instance. Why? Warmer year round. And so they can rely on those insects. Now here's an interesting thing. How about our Phoebe? We have an insect eating fly catcher that lives year round here. It's the only one. How is it able to live around it? All the other flycatchers have to go down south and migrate because it lives near water. And water tempers the yes. extreme temperatures I and you'll always have insects around water I so they can that. live here year round. So that's a great example of an exception. All flycatchers have to go down except those guys because they, uh, they've been able to deal with it a different way. It's the forest, right? Mm -hmm. Blue jays live east of the, live, live east of the, of the, of the Rockies or Oh. Does everybody recognize that? No. Who is that? Western scripture. Yeah. Or, or California. Yeah. <laughs> I, get a little, I get an acorn for a And what do you suppose he's saying? Uh, who are you and why are you coming my way? Yeah. yeah. Or, or, or maybe even there's danger. Yeah. You're talking to maybe the others. Because he doesn't want to talk to us. He want, they want to talk to each other. And he's blue because of why? The light. The light. The light. Yeah, the blue parts of the spectrum are scattered and the color, other colors of the spectrum are absorbed. Yes. And so we see blue. And what group of birds do they belong to generally? We call these corvids. That's a good word to know. Jays, magpies, ravens, and crows all belong to the family called corvidae. And they are, believe it or not, songbirds. They're passeriforms. Uh, but they're very different and they're not your average passive form. And uh, they are generalists. And when you're a generalist, you have to be what humans think of as intelligent. And so that's why they can recognize faces and they have all this, you know, what we call intelligence. And they uh, find the nuts that they even that the squirrels leave behind. Yeah, so yeah. Are they're, 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 they're oh. amazing. Did you know that there are more corvids that use tools than yes. all of the mammals? Yes. And did you know wow. that the so-called smartest mammal, again, I don't like that term because yes. we just related to us and we're not seeming so smart these days, but <laughs> as far as long term, but that's another story. Uh, uh, it turns out the New Caledonian crow can work out puzzles that are more complex than chimpanzees. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the smartest bird in the world is actually a crow, not a chimpanzee. Very, very the second smart. to... Yep. More than oh, 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 we got something real. Uh oh, look at that. We've got that. There's our close up. 
Guy with the black hood. What do we call the guy with the black hood? He's got a white. There you go. There you go. Yep. He's got a dark-eyed junco. And he's got two white outer tail feathers, and he's flitting around up there. Yeah. And notice that he's not feeding up there. Juncos do not feed up in trees. He's moving around for one reason or another. They stay low and they feed down on the ground or down yes. low. Yeah. Is he oh, there you go. Us out? Is that what he's there you go. He's just moving around there. Now, juncos have a seed eating bill. It's thick at the base and yes. they crack seeds, right? Uh, would he ever eat insects? Almost all seed eating birds have to feed their young insects. So, seed eating yeah. birds switch in the spring and summer to insects. So they feed them to the babies and they eat them as well. And that gives them protein that they need to grow. You can't raise, unless you have a special trick, you can't raise babies on seeds. And so pigeons have milk where they actually eat a bunch of seeds, extract the amino acids to make proteins and then secrete milk in their throat. And, uh, and then finches can, um, uh, uh, can actually grow up on that. But they, they, they have uh, other uh, chemical ways to do that. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Good eye. We've got a, a, a woodpecker hole there. There must be a cavity down in there. Pretty small, uh, probably most likely a downy because look how the how narrow be able to work, uh, uh, how narrow it would be in there. Or one of the smaller. There's nut halls here. There's downies, uh, probably harries, and of course the acorn woodpecker. That's too small for it most of those. And you got flickers. Flickers are a ground yes. woodpecker. You got the northern flicker here, the red shafted form. They spend time feeding on ants on the ground. Again, resource partitioning. Yeah. And those over here. No, these are skunk. Skunk have wow. five. One, two, three, four, five. And they have a one, three, one toe pattern and they have these wide pads. Yes. Yeah, so that's skunk. My mistake. Okay. Yeah. And they're all okay. around. Look at them. Here and here and here and here. <laughs> oh my gosh, you poor people in the back. <laughs> here, let's go around. They can see them here. Here, it's where the rock is. So there are three uh, right three in front of trees, us. Three pine trees, a fir tree. There are uh, about almost to the top. Make a oh, clock. Oh yeah. And then go in from seven o'clock and go oh, in. Oh yeah, big one. See? Right at the top on the w big tree oh, on the oh, left. left. The furthest yeah, left. Yeah, the very yeah. left the tree. The, the highest one. one over there. Highest yes. tree, just at seven o'clock from the top. Yeah. Oh wow. That's a big bird. What is it? I think it's a. Uh, looks like a. It's hard to tell. That was you see it, Stacy? It looks like I. Red shoulder. It's on the left. It's a raptor. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. That's definitely a raptor. It looks more like a red-tailed hawk than a red shoulder. Yeah. Uh, one of our binoculars. It's way up on. Very close yeah, to the top. Just look for the first outcrop. Yeah. Like yeah. That's a little. Uh, it looks like it is. Looks like a little chested. leopard frog to me. It doesn't have that. Yeah. Looks like it is. Rana. Have the white. Black yeah, tail, yeah. you just found this? Yeah, I just found it on the ground. That's great. Yeah, look at that. You can see all of its little pelvis and its little ribs. And you can see it doesn't have a neck. These guys use uh, uh, guler pumping to be able to breathe. They actually don't really breathe with lungs that much. They circulate. You ever notice they're always doing that? That's their, that's their breathing. Yeah, big mouth because frogs are designed to eat things that are a lot bigger than their than their uh, 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 mouth, so they can open their mouths huge. And of course, they're big jumpers. <laughs> Look at it go up and down, up and down, Ooh, da, 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 up, 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 down, down, down. Flash my white, flash my white. Look at that. <laughs> he's good. He's gonna tell his friend. There's that wacko hypothesis as to why that happens. The one that's most, uh, 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 I think, agreed upon is that it's worth risking your life a little bit to assure your predator is out of your nesting territory. You know, they only do it during nesting time. Uh -huh. And an interesting thing about birds, did you know this? This is really a fascinating thing about birds. To save weight, male birds have only their testes. So let's say you're looking at, a, at, a, at a, uh, maybe a jay, okay? And their testes, right, are, um, the only the left one gets larger in the spring for, for testosterone so that's why they're not aggressive during much of the year but they're only aggressive and will attack during the times around nesting because their testes grow 500 times bigger than in the winter it's the size of a bb most of the year but when it's time to be horny that thing gets the size of a kidney bean <laughs> yeah and you so you can always tell a horny bird it flies a little to the left <laughs> 
Yeah, seriously, they don't have a right testis. It's like almost gone. So they just have a really small left one, and then when it's time to use it, it just grows. So that's a great weight-saving thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Who needs balls if you don't need them, right? Looped cords in the scat. They have more uh, homogeneous scat that has constrictions and tapers. See how this is, this is a classic skunk. And if you were to smell it, it's a sweet. Skunk scat smells sweet. For your buckeye, and it's summer deciduous. And so its strategy is just close up shop when it's too hot and dry. So they don't have to tap deep water. They don't have to do all the other, other things that, uh, that uh, these other trees are doing. And they can also uh, save water so that they can have a new crop of leaves every year. So and of course, those are the fruits. Have you ever seen the yes. long spike flowers mm -hmm. that they have? One of those flowers will actually become uh -huh. pollinated and used to make this fruit here, which is toxic, and as you probably all know. What was that? Uh, so they leaf out a lot earlier than other ones? That's right. Yeah. yeah. In fact, what I, I call them early tree with kids. The iridescence, yeah. right? Yeah. So the bending of light. Beautiful. Yeah, look at that. So what do you think? Do you think this feather has the little... Uh, barbules and the hamuli and all that. Remember the little on hooks the and the little flanges? On the this one does, but not here. Not there. That's the whole Yeah, yeah. And then boots. same thing here. So this is for insulation and then this is for uh, protection. So yes. different. Uh, one feather can actually have two different functions. Mm. Cool. Yeah. And so you can see the camber on this. Camber. So, so yeah. this is a primary and when this is Air is going through it like this. Yes. Air is taking longer to get over here, shorter to go over here, and so this is what's creating the forward thrust. The oh, secondaries are what's necessary for the lift, and yes. they're doing that as a whole wing. Okay. But each one of the primaries is acting like a wing itself, yes. but rather than this way, it's this, this way. way. And okay. they just move that so air so through. So the longer part And this shows edge? that camber. Hmm? Is the longer part the leading edge or the shorter part? Uh, the, 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 the part of the vein part. is the smaller vein in this case. And that's because turkeys really are, well, or all the galliformes, uh, if you, well, they don't just fly around, right? They actually just, uh, they, 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 they burst. Yeah. yeah. And that's why they don't have blood in their breasts like other birds. They have white meat, right? And that's so that blood is able to uh, 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 be forced into that area very quickly. And so they can just do a burst of flight. They don't fly around like other birds, right? And they also will fly in the tops of trees and roost at night. And so that works better with a wing like this because they're not flying for long periods of time. It's so they have, bring uh, them up. The, so, yeah, so the leading, uh, these are called veins. There's two veins and then the rachis. The leading vein is almost gone. And look at that camber. You can see the yes. camber we were talking about. Very cool. Uh, a mutualistic relationship between fungi and algae. And they just found out recently yeasts are also in on this. So there's a threesome now. And of course, one's producing food, one's able to absorb nutrients from the air. This particular one, Ramalina, is, uh, is, is particularly ubiquitous and uh, 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 common in areas where you can get fog some times of the year. Yeah, isn't that, that's isn't that wonderful? And it goes like this and then it's yeah, well, open like this when the wind goes down, and then this goes like this, and then that moves it forward. Here, show the people in the back. So why is that a secondary and not a primary? Junko nest. Good eyes. Look at that. That's exactly where Junko's nest. Everybody see that here? Isn't that wonderful? So for those of you in the back, it's the one right by the plant here. <laughs> I, in my experience, it takes a while. You have to really move through it because they blend in so well. I don't see any pellets, but they never just sit on top. They always roll down. <laughs> but uh, I bet you anything there would be. Is that and the feathers? We have the time to look through, but I don't think we're going to have the time. And they bring it down their flow <coughs> and they store it down in the roots. Mm -hmm. And so the reds and the yellows we call carotenoids, they are then still they're then now exposed they were always there why are they there they take the other parts of the light and use that and pass that onto the chlorophyll so they can use that as energy because anything that's green means it's not using the green so the yellows and the reds are using the green end but that's what light what color is color is light garbage it's what's not being used yes huh. from a small bird mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, possibly a, a warbler uh, kinglets don't nest here well, they're like little helicopter wings. Yeah, yeah. like little helicopters. Yeah. And so the seeds are in here. See where they were? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So they're cracking that and taking all that out. Do you know what the name of this kind of fruit is called? The ones that 
You wings. throw them up Something and they like that. They're wing fruit. Dispersal. They're called Samaras. Oh. Samaras. <laughs> and that's easy to remember because if you throw them up and the wind catches them, you won't see them until Samara. <laughs> going to be partners and here's something for the two of you to look at. You two will be partners. An interesting way you can um, tell about what a bird eats and um, that is by looking at something on the bird. So let's read the title of this worksheet. Ready? You can, you can tell, tell what they, they eat by their bills and their feet. What's a bill? If there was another word for bill. It's, a, it's their beak, right. So let's look at the first bird and um, I let's read what that bird eats. Caterpillars, beetles, and crawling insects. Got it. Turn to your partner and see if you can figure out uh, what is it about the beak or the feet that helps that bird find those particular mm, items. Mm, perching. Go ahead and talk to your partner. Uh, so that means it could find 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 something from the body. True. And small beak. Okay, do you guys agree? So that bird can use their beak like tweezers to pick up these crawling insects. Very Using good. Using a spear too? And, or a stabbing it. Yeah, good. Um, let's look at the second bird and talk to your part. Oh, first let's read the food. Rats, and mice, snakes, and grasshoppers. So talk to your partner. What about the beak and feet might help with that? Yes. Uh, the beak, we can, looks like you could rip and tear, grab a hold with the beak. All right. Anybody else want to add to that? On the feet would be able to hold on to it really tight. That's exactly right. Exactly. And so fast. The second half of this lesson is learning a little bit about particular birds. I have to give you a warning that um, this is the yellow bird kit, so they're all identified by a color. So in the Santa Rosa Kit Keeper has a yellow and a blue kit, and the um, Snowmo one has a red and a green kit. Every one of the kits has totally different birds in it than what I'm about to show you. But don't worry about it, because um, I'll show you the next part, and you don't have to know anything about these birds to do this lesson. So next I would bring out um, the first bird skin and, okay, I'm back to treating you as if you're children. Ooh. So kids, this is, yeah. Am I doing okay? This, this is a bird called a bird skin. And it, what, um, I want you all to know that no bird was killed um, to bring it to you here. These birds all died with natural causes and then they're treated, um, and stuffed with cotton. Okay, so I'm gonna walk around and you can use a finger and, and touch this if you want, but I do want you now to t use your chart still and talk to your partner and see if you can figure out what this bird eats by looking at the beak and the feet. This is, by the way, this is a Cooper's hawk. Okay. Oh, Cooper's hawk. Number two. And here's the important question, why? What, why? What, what makes you think that? Yeah. The beak. Okay, the beak is hooked and... It's got talons. Very good, okay. And um, before we go on to the next, oh, so before we go to the next bird, um, also in the kit are, are kid-friendly um, field guide cards on each bird. So, so here's a... Some cool facts about the Cooper's Hawk. Uh, would any one of you like to pick one fact off of this card and read it to the group so we can learn a little more about Cooper's Hawks? They are very fast flyers. All right, very good. And if you had time, you could. Um, just so you know, uh, in these tubes, you want to take them out head first and then you put them back in head first, so that both ends open. Okay, so I'll start over here this time. And um, so also be looking at your chart and talking to your partner and see if you can figure out what this word means. Uh, what um, have you all decided, what does it eat? Nectar. Nectar. And what, what about this made you think so? It's beak. Because it's beak. What's the beak good for? 
So it's like a needle, it's for sucking out right. juices. All right, there you go.